Chapter Twenty Six of Julia Reed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Julia Reed by Pansy. Chapter Twenty Six. In which I feel my destiny approaching. Have you ever heard of Mr. Alec Tyndall, brother to our Mr. Tyndall? This was the question that Mr. Sales asked me one evening as we were coming home from church. Abby had been detained at home by a slight illness, and we were alone. No, or yes, I answered. I have heard of him. Mrs. Tyndall mentions his name occasionally. You don't know, I presume, that he is coming home? I don't know where he is, nor where his home is. And you are at this moment engaged in wondering why I think you should care to know anything about him, he answered, laughing. But what if I tell you that his homecoming ensures us a wedding in our circle? A wedding, I repeated in astonishment. Yes, and a speedy one, I trust. The waiting has been long and weary enough. I can't imagine what you are talking about. Where is this gentleman coming from, and where is he coming, and who is going to be married, and how did it all happen? What a rush of questions! Your indifference vanishes the moment a wedding is proposed. Well, this gentleman is coming from California, where he took refuge several years ago after the financial crash. He will be here in perhaps two weeks, possibly sooner, and, now I am going to astonish you, the lady involved in this matter is Frank Hooper. Frank Hooper? I ejaculated in utter amazement. How can that be possible? Why, when did it come to pass? Is she really engaged to him? She is, and has been for the last four years. There is quite a long story connected with it. Frank's father, you know, was a very wealthy man, but lost everything in the financial panic between two and three years ago. About three it is now. Alec was wealthy, too, and met with the same fate. He was involved with his brother, and he would have crashed, too, if it hadn't been for his wife. She is the wealthy one, you know. Alec lost everything, and there was no resort but to begin at the foot of the hill. He fled to California, where he has been ever since. He has been successful beyond his wildest hopes, and now I suppose he is speeding toward home and Frank. But I don't understand, I said in a greatly perplexed tone. If they have been engaged all this time, how is it that people know nothing about it? Nobody does, do they? Not a soul save myself. That was a freak of theirs. Perhaps you don't need to be told that Mrs. Tyndall hasn't always been absolutely angelic in her dealings with people, and didn't love Frank very deeply. Alec knew her well, and had an immense respect for her and for her ability to do mischief, so he conceived the brilliant idea of keeping the entire matter a secret. It was a comparatively easy thing to do. You see, he did not live here. He was in business in New York, but he was also connected with his brother's firm, and that of itself brought him here frequently. And so by taking me into complete confidence, and letting me engineer the correspondence, we had it all arranged. A tedious time they have had of it, though. I am glad for them that the struggle is over. But I thought that you... This much I said, and then I stopped in confusion. He laughed pleasantly. You thought what the rest of the world did, I presume, that I was being attentive to Frank on my own account, and then that I had deserted her on the eve of marriage, and still hovered around her, much as a moth might be supposed to treat a candle, and no end of nonsense. Frank and I have had merry times over the whole story. Only, Julia, I did think you would hardly believe it of me, about the base desertion part at least. You know enough evil of me, certainly, but I declare I did not think you would consider me quite so far down as that. I only half believed it, I said eagerly. Some of the time I did not believe it at all, only I thought there must be some sort of foundation for it, I had the story so very straight. Yes, I know, or at least I suppose Dr. Douglas enlightened you. I know he has believed it religiously. It is a wonder that he has succeeded in treating me as well as he has. Does he know about it now? Not he. He gives me courteous little hints every day about one of the duties of a new Christian life, to undo the mistakes that have been made so far as it is in one's power, and I know he classes Frank among the mistakes. Why don't you tell him? For two reasons. First, having kept Frank's secret so long, I don't propose to go around enlightening people. I mean to let circumstances do that. It will be vastly more interesting, I think, though I make an exception in your favor, you see. Secondly, I think Dr. Douglas, good noble man though he is, needs a little bit of a lesson. 
he is almost as ready as commoner mortals are to deliberately swallow those prodigious lies that go floating around town about people. I'm using very strong language. I beg pardon. But the subject demands some indignation. I am not offended with the doctor. I used to be. I used to nearly detest him on this very account, and but for interposing circumstances I should almost have merited his contempt by doing the very thing, in a sense, that he believed of me, merely to prove to him that I did not do it. That's talking in riddles to you, isn't it? Never mind. I'm glad you are so pure and open-hearted. It is that, in a sense, which has saved me. Well, I am not at all out of sorts with the doctor now. I know him to be thoroughly pure gold, and he certainly had strong provocation for believing the stories about me. You see, Frank and Alec were to have been married in about six weeks, when the crash came, and people knew that she was, and knowing nothing about Alec, naturally supposed that I was. Only the question is, why should I have been pitched up as the perpetrator of a great meanness because she packed her marriage robes away in a trunk, instead of wearing them, when I was with her just the same, not a break of twenty-four hours in our friendship? Wouldn't that have been a queer way to have managed the other matter? But people are not willing to give me the benefit of the doubt. They were more than ready to pitch into me if there was anything ugly that needed believing. Why, all right. However, the doctor wasn't here during the time that all this occurred, and is more excusable. At the same time, it won't hurt him to discover that he made a blunder. Don't imagine that I blame you, Julia, for crediting the story in a measure. It was the most natural thing imaginable under the circumstances. I did not credit it, I said earnestly. At least I mean, I thought that it could be explained in a way that would not compromise you, and Mrs. Tyndall, you know, never thought any such thing. No, he said, laughing. She thought something worse. That is, she professed to think that it was a grand flirtation on my part, and a grand effort on Frank's part to secure a husband. But I always gave her the credit of thinking that she didn't believe any such thing. She thought I wanted Frank and couldn't get her. I know she did. It was a very reasonable thing to think. It must have looked like that to those who disbelieved the other two stories, and must have something to rest their hopes on. Besides, Mrs. Tyndall was exceedingly fearful, lest that should be the state of things. She didn't like Frank, and she wanted to keep her down, out of her circle. You may imagine I enjoyed her state of mind, knowing all the time that Frank was destined to be her sister-in-law. It is all very queer, I said, feeling very light-hearted that all things were just as they were. When will they be married? Why, very soon, I should think, though I know but little about it. I haven't heard from Tyndall personally for months. I get hosts of envelopes addressed to me in his handwriting, but not a line does he vouchsafe to me beyond the bare announcement that he was to sail in such a steamer, and would telegraph me on his arrival in New York. I haven't heard from him directly since December. However, I suffered in a good cause. Frank has had longer letters in consequence, I presume. Is this Mr. Tyndall a Christian man? I asked, and Mr. Sale's voice saddened at once. Oh, dear, no, he is very far removed from that. When I used to be constantly with him, he was nearly, if not quite, an infidel. I don't think he led me as far into the mist as he was himself, but far enough to cause me some miserable days and nights since, and I have no reason to hope that he has changed his views since that time. Don't you dread his influence over Frank? Indeed I do. She is so new in the Christian life that she needs much help instead of such powerful hindrance, and I dread his influence over his brother very much, and, I might add, over myself. He is a very fascinating man, has almost a magnetic influence over people, and a very sarcastic man, ready and willing to turn anything into a kind of quiet, gentlemanly ridicule. I don't know how his brother is going to endure it. Alec will be a member of his family, I presume, for a time. Very likely he will never be in or on hand at the hour of family prayers, but what he will say at the idea of a blessing being asked at his brother's table, or whether Tyndall will have the courage to attempt it or not, I don't know. I feel in a very good deal of trouble about it all. Does Frank feel disturbed? I don't know. I haven't had the heart to ask her. She has had such a stormy life of late years, only so recently settled into calm, that I haven't felt equal to suggesting more breakers ahead, especially as the suggestion would do no sort of good. No, thank you. I cannot go in tonight. I have a little business that must be attended to. I am to keep this story quiet, I suppose? Yes, please. 
they will know in a day or two, if they do not already, that Alec is coming. Frank says he wrote his brother by the same steamer that her last letters came, but his letter seems to have been delayed. About the rest of it he must tell his own stories, of course, and I wish him joy of the scene. Mrs. Tyndall is very much changed in many respects, but I fancy she will not like Frank Hooper for a sister. By the way, you can gossip over this matter with your cousin Abby if you choose. I mentioned it to her last evening, but did not tell her particulars. I will not keep you from her longer, for she said she had something special to talk with you about, and I shall have something special to say to you tomorrow evening. Can I see you? Yes, I answered, and then I went in with glowing cheeks and shining eyes. Just here I have paused, pen in hand, and thought whether or not, since this history of part of my life was destined to be used as a Sabbath school book, it would be well for me to write herein some of the thoughts that filled my heart that night, and some of the incidents that followed. It seems to be quite generally believed that a Sabbath school book should utterly ignore two great questions that have to do with human hearts, love and marriage. I never was able to understand why. Certainly young misses of sixteen think of these matters, and even those who attend Sabbath school and draw Sabbath school books think of them, I believe, a great deal more than is well for them. I am sure I did. Why should I then, in giving to these young ladies the story of a piece of my life, in the sincere hope that it may help them to avoid my blunders and causes of failure and unhappiness, why should I be very plain and frank as regards other subjects, and quite silent in this, merely in the fear that some critic will criticize my story for having broached in it the awful and forbidden subject. I will tell you my story truthfully, without the fear of a critic before my eyes. Plainly, then, I came into the hall in a great flutter. I felt sure that a crisis in my destiny was coming to me on swift wings. Tomorrow evening he would have something special to say to me. Didn't I feel in every throb of my heart what it would be? Didn't I know when he was taking such pains to explain to me that he had never been other than a friend to Frank Hooper, just what he meant me to understand? Life looked very rose-color to me. I remember the feeling well. I went up with swift feet to Abby. I was eager for sympathy. I pulled down my hair and began in a very nervous way to braid it, while, as Abby questioned me about the meeting, I tried to determine in my own mind which I should do. Should I tell her first about that last sentence spoken in such a peculiarly meaning tone as he clasped my hand, or should I tell her all about Frank and the wedding in prospect, and the commotion that would probably be awakened in our household, waiting until the glaring gaslight was turned out, and only the soft, quiet moon gave us light, while I told her of the other and the rush of sweet hopes and plans and possibilities that had been set to throbbing in my heart? I decided on the latter course. She was deeply interested in Frank, and questioned eagerly and earnestly, so that it was not until just after I had finished the last braid and said, Shan't I turn out the gas now, and won't we have a bit of quiet talk in the moonlight? That she, assenting eagerly, and standing there, leaning her head against the window sash, and looking out into the glorious beauty of the night, said, Did Mr. Sales say anything of me? Yes, I answered promptly. He said I might tell you all about this matter of Frank's, and— Oh, yes, he said you had something special to tell me about. What is it, Abby? She turned a little then, and let me see her face, sweet and pure and smiling, and she said softly, I have something very special. I wanted to tell you that last evening he asked me to be his wife. End of chapter 26 Recording by Tricia G.